what you're looking at are all the tubes that failed in my tube tester. And I'm going to give you an idea of what a failed tube looks like. This is a 12AT7, one of the failures. And I've got all the buttons set up the way it's supposed to be. And when I pull this lever down to the value position, I'm supposed to get anywhere between 3.5 to 5.4, which would be right around 3.5. Let me get my pin here. About 3.5 to 5.4, somewhere in that range right there. That's what we should get. Now watch what happens when I pull the lever on this baby. Barely moves. Barely moves upscale. Now, there's a second position on this. I have to go down to position 3 here and pull the lever on that. So we'll pull these together. Watch what happens on the second time. The second, look at that. Even less. That tube is shot. That's what you call a burned out ham operator's tube. Hooray for him. And we'll show you one more and then we'll kind of wrap all this up. Unless I have a change, all of those tubes are going to be bad. And I'll have to uh, dig around in my stash and see what I can do to make them up. And if what I can't make up, I will contact Gino. Now I've got a 6EA8 in there, and it's supposed to read 4.2 to 6.4. 4.2 to 6.4. Right there. When I pull the lever down, barely gets up over the 4. It's about 4.21. Too marginal too marginal. Well that's it. Uh, I rechecked these tubes after cleaning the bases a second time making sure the pins were straightened up and I even read uh, a little more in the book to make sure I was doing it right because when you have seven tubes out of a rig that all test bad you know the odds are pretty high you might be doing something wrong. Well it turns out I'm not doing something wrong so these were bad tubes. All seven of them. They need to go. Let's take a little look inside this thing. Uh, it's been cleaned up quite a bit, like I said, but uh, the circuit board is much darker in this area than it was on my uh, HW101. This radio's had a lot of use over the years, and uh, probably mostly by Raymond, who's, who was the original purchaser, you know, back in the, he probably purchased this thing back in the 50s, and, uh, you know, ham radio was a big thing back in those days, I mean, everybody was, they talk, talk, talk for hours, so this old radio probably was, was used extensively, and it was probably left on a lot, and it just kind of sat there in uh, sort of a standby mode uh, when it was not being used, so, you know, it got a little bit warm down in there, so old Russ is going to have to do a little bit of work, and, uh, you know, he'll have to replace on probably almost every resistor in it and uh, several capacitors, uh, that's for sure. But that's, uh, that's his job. He'll do well on it, I'm sure. And there's the speaker. It's in excellent condition. Not a thing wrong with it. And uh, the speaker cord comes out the back, plugs into the rear of the radio. This entire power supply will fit up inside here and bolt to those... Uh, to those four holes usually, two on each side, uh, let me see here, there's two holes on each side that bolt it in, hold it in, so the entire rig uh, actually consists of just two components, kind of neat. And he'll have to replace uh, electrolytics in this, and there's no doubt about that. I've already opened it up on the bottom, found a few loose things and fixed those up, but uh, right now the power cord will be next. This is the new power cord we're going to go ahead and put on the power supply. The old power cord was flat. It was three ribbon, uh, three wire flat cord and of course this is the new heftier, stronger and uh, three wire type. And you can see we've got plenty of room right there. Plenty of room. and Which means I ought to be able to ream out this uh, strain relief that held the old flat one in. Take my motor tool, ream it out to where it will still clamp down on this wire here and still fit in there and jam it in. So let's see what happens. I'm just going to get the old Moto tool fired up and start shaving it down. This thing separates into two pieces. Well, I just hate doing stuff one-handed. As you can see, it separates into two pieces. We can go ahead, I think, and make that work. The power cord is in. It's pretty snug. Not going to go anywhere. And uh, right now I'm going to go ahead and hook up these wires where they go. 
and we have 340 microfarad uh, electrolytics right here this two smaller ones are 125 volts or 150 volts I'm sorry and this big one is rated at 450 volts so I think I might have 340 microfarad uh, 450 volt caps I'll probably put in there at least I hope so I really don't want to fire this thing up uh, and put the power to the transceiver without these three caps being changed the rest these larger capacitors these four right here we can kind of bring those up very very slowly on the bariac and maybe get them to perform but these smaller ones these older types I kind of worry about those I want to get rid of those I don't want to ruin this power supply before it's had a chance to to go to Russ out in Kentucky that's it we've got the power cord in and soldered up and the 340 microfarad electrolytics have been replaced with 47 microfarad electrolytics all rated at 450 volts now I feel a whole lot better about going ahead and applying power to this thing I feel a little safer I just didn't want those old capacitors to to maybe ruin something or I don't I don't really know what they might ruin but I didn't want to take any chances these will still have to be replaced but I think uh, from past experience I know that if we bring them up slow in the variac very slow take quite a while bringing them up that they'll they'll work fine but eventually you know I mean I would recommend Russ that you go ahead and change all four of these oldheathkitparts.com oldheathkitparts.com you can buy 150 microfarad capacitors for these things and you can restuff them which is what I recommend we've just about got this thing ready to test out but first I want to go ahead and spray all of the uh, tube sockets and clean them up each one is going to get a little bath best I can and then uh, later on Russ you're going to have to do a thorough cleaning especially down this darkened area here and uh, it probably might not be such a bad idea to remove each of those circuit boards give them a good scrubbing and then put them all back in uh, around the outside edge uh, on these screws here they all constitute grounds and uh, you want to make sure each one of those screws is really making good contact underneath underneath the board is making good contact with that rail uh, beneath it so let's finish spraying and cleaning up uh, the tube sockets anyway okay she's all done uh, about as clean as I can get it with just spraying I also went ahead and sprayed your uh, driver pre-select uh, variable capacitor also got a little bit of crud out of there these rubber uh, belts are in excellent shape I can't believe it they're in perfect condition they're not split or frayed or anything all right this is going to have to wrap up this video I put all the tubes in it that I had that checked out good but I was still short two tubes a couple of 6 EA8s and a 6GW8 just one of those so I contacted Gino and he's uh, sending me some out in Monday's mail today's Saturday and of course uh, the missing tube shield was right here on the uh, 6CL6 I believe it is yeah there's where it was missing so I got out the old scissors and a piece of flashing I had and, and made another tube shield for it it'll work fine Russ until Russ uh, can get an original or you can just go ahead and leave it in there. It'll work forever, probably. <laughs> well, that's it. Until next time, uh, we'll get the tubes in. Gino will, I'm sure, fire those babies out uh, on Monday. And uh, I hope you all return for the grand finale where we power it up and hopefully get a few squawks and squeals out of it. And once we hear somebody talking, that's it. It's over with. We're done. It's on its way to Russ. He can carry it from there. So I hope to see everybody next time. This is John.